Well, hey, good morning, each and every one of you. I'm Daniel, I serve on team here. So good to extend a warm welcome to each of you, to the graduates in the room. Congratulations, you did it. You made it through whatever those last four years of suffering and torment have meant to you, but you did it. You're a graduate of elementary school, well done. <laughs> Middle school and high school, well done, well done, well done. But hey, also happy Memorial Weekend to each one of you. So on behalf of the team here, happy Memorial Weekend to you. Pray you have a fantastic today, uh, day tomorrow and also today, but a weekend uh, where you remember what it is, it's not just a time to grill some steaks and all, but actually to reflect upon the value and what it is that this weekend means. Uh, you're joining us on a great weekend where we are continuing on in our series going through John's Gospel. So if you have a Bible with you, go ahead and turn with me to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And as you're turning there, I want to make mention of an event that we have coming up, a prayer worship and night of the prophetic with Tom and Susie Brock. It's coming up here in early June, the night of Friday the 9th, and also Saturday morning the 10th. If you are wanting to grow in the prophetic, it's a workshop on Saturday, but also on that Friday evening, it's a fantastic time of worship, prayer, and the prophetic here in this room. So I'd encourage you to join Tom and Susie Brock and our team for a night where we're just going to say, come Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come and speak. And so there will be personalized prophetic words, likely words for our church that evening. Uh, Tom and Susie are good friends of Laurie and I and have come now a couple of times here to Colorado. I met them in England, but they're not English. They're from California. It's a whole different country than England. And um, <clears throat> anyway, we're looking forward to them coming again. But anyway, as I made mention of, we're in John chapter 8. And today we are looking at a pretty forceful conversation between Jesus and a bunch of religious people. And uh, really today's message is going to sound a lot like a sermon on a sermon because it is. Today's content is really digging into what appears to be like a sermon that Jesus gives. But this sermon today we're going to look at is full of bicker and banter. It's full of slander and sarcasm. And truly, there is accusation. There is wrong statement. There is all kind of stuff going on in this passage. And so it's a really good passage to look at on a weekend. But let's pray, and then we'll get into the passage. We'll spend most of our time on verse 12, and then we'll walk our way through the entirety of the remainder of chapter 8. But let's pray. Father, we pray right now in this moment that you would move by your spirit. We pray, Father, that our lives would be conformed to the person and the image of Jesus. Spirit of God, would you put within us a growing substance of Christ, that our lives would take upon the image and the identity of Jesus, that we would recognize and truly realize whose we are and who we are in the kingdom of God. So, Father, would you now use this time to really, through your word and through the work of Christ upon the cross, transform us. God, if we are here today and we haven't gone to church in an awful long time or whether we were here last weekend or even here throughout this past week, Father, we recognize it is not church attendance that checks the box, but heart repentance that changes the life. So we want our lives changed. We want our lives changed. We want our parents' lives changed. We want our kiddos' lives changed, the grandchildren that we see coming forth. So Lord, start now in us, we pray in your name. Amen. Last week we looked at a passage that is shrouded in canonical mystery. And what I mean by that is simply John 7, 53 through John 8, 11, it says the earliest manuscripts do not contain this reference. And I explained some of the canonical background of that last weekend, but it was throughout this past week where I really reflected upon that moment. Because scripture doesn't give us a great deal of specificity in terms of what happens other than some stones are laid behind the oldest leaf first and Jesus remains there looking at this woman. And this past week I began to visualize in my mind what was going through that woman's mind. Like literally she had just got a new lease on life. She had literally been given a new chance, a new beginning. And so in that moment I kind of in my mind imagine her starting to look at Jesus and then the tears began to crest her cheek and they begin to fall and she goes, I, I guess I should go. And Jesus, by grace, has changed her life. But in that moment, I, I visualize her turning around and slowly walking away and again, tears leaving her face and she is going, what can I do to transform my life? And recognizing that she had just been given a new lease on life. The words that Jesus spoke over her there, the woman caught in adultery, were scandalous as they were freeing. It brought freedom to this woman. And as she walked back, I too think Jesus was moved in that moment. 
Our Jesus is not detached from the reality of our lives. He is, in the Spirit, connected to every part of our lives. And I believe that Jesus was moved in that moment as he watched her walking away. So much so, I believe that verse 12 is so apropos, it's so so perfectly fitting to what he has just seen her go through. He says, I am the light of the world, like for her. I am the light of the world, like for her, and for whoever follows me. They will not walk in darkness, but they will have the light of life. And I love to picture Jesus looking at her as she walked away. But you know, there is more here than just the symbolism as it relates to her freedom that she found through the words of Jesus. And so much so, what I believe is happening here is that Jesus is leveraging a cultural moment. I believe that he doesn't just arbitrarily come up with this motif of light. I believe that he is leveraging something that they are experiencing as a people at that time. During the autumn festivals, there in the courtyard of the women, a part of the temple grounds, they would erect four large candelabras. And these big, big oil lamps, if you will, would be erected there in the courtyard of the women, and then they would have these fellas climb up on ladders. They're 14 feet tall, and he, they would light them every evening at sundown. And then these massive candelabras would cause all of this light to splash out all over the temple. And the people were aware of it. In a community such as Jerusalem that sits lower around the temple, I believe all of this light, based upon the elevation of the temple, but also the 14 feet tall candelabras, was causing light to splash not only upon the temple, but all around this this community, this city on a hill, this, this Jerusalem, if you will. And in a town that didn't have street lamps, I believe what Jesus is saying here is this. He is saying, in the way that you walked home last night under the light, In that same way, you can walk in the light. You can walk in the light. And as much as there is that degree of significance, there is also a history rooted here. Because the candelabras were set up in the first place to remind the Jewish people that God had led them to freedom from slavery from Egypt through the pillar of fire by night and the cloud, the pillar of cloud by day. And so they would do what they could do to simulate this moment of great light to where we are remembering what God had done. Well, what I believe Jesus is doing here is simply this. In the same way that the people of God had an exodus of the Old Testament, I believe that Jesus says, and I am the light of the world, and there will be a new exodus for all people through me, through my light. Well, furthermore, there is even more to kind of uncover here, so go, go geographical with me for a moment. Jerusalem is a city that resides upon Mount Moriah. That's the reason every time you read in the passage in the scripture, it says they went up to Jerusalem. They ascended, if you will. Why? Because of the elevation of their being on Mount Moriah. The temple itself being built upon where Abraham would have sacrificed Isaac, but God's provision of a ram caught in a thicket, they're the provision of the sacrifice. But as a city, it is built upon, or parts of it, upon Mount Moriah. Well, to the south and to the west, there are two valleys. Some of you right now are thinking, Daniel's been to Israel too many times, we don't care to know about this. You do, and let me get to that. There are two valleys. One is the Kidron Valley, and the other is the Valley of Hinnom or Gehenna. Same valley, different name. One valley, the Valley of Kidron, is narrow and shallow. You can cross it easily. In fact, you would leave the temple, go down the southern steps, you would cross over there into the Kidron Valley and ascend the elevation of the Mount of Olives. Whereas, by contrast, the Valley of Hinnom, or the valley known as Gehenna, was deep and wide. Because it was so deep and wide, there in Jerusalem, even upon the elevated position, it was so deep to where you couldn't see into the depth of it. Contrast that with the Kidron to where you could look across it. The Gehenna, the, the Gehenna was so deep that you couldn't see to the depths of it. So much so, they thought, great. We don't want to see our rubbish when we're done with it. So they would metaphorically take their wheelbarrow. Let me translate for the audience, not rubbish, trash. We don't want to see our trash. So they want to put it in a place known as the city dump. Gehenna became known as the city dump. They would bring their wheelbarrow. They would hook the front part above the wheel. And they would throw the wall, so to speak, throw it over the wall. And then here as the rubbish would tumble down into the depth of the valley. That valley was known as Gehenna. And you've heard of this valley. The city dump valley has a lot of symbolism in scripture. Not only was it the place where Judas Iscariot, after betraying Jesus, went and hung himself, 
Gehenna, or Hinnom, is also the valley that the gospel writers speak of when they speak about the place of destruction and standing against the kingdom of God. They used it synonymously, Gehenna and hell. So much so, going back to last week just for a moment. Going back in time just for a moment to last weekend, we looked at Matthew 5 where Jesus gave us this new criterion. He says, you have heard that it has been said this about adultery, but I say to you, anyone who has looked upon a man or a woman with lust in their heart, meaning it resides within them, he says, it is better that they pluck out their right eye or it's better that they cut off their right hand other than the risk of their entire body being cast into where? Gehenna. The word is hell, but it's actually Gehenna. He says it's better that you actually save your life and turn and surrender it to Jesus than your life be thrown into the place of great destruction. Well, now let me bring this full circle. When Jesus says to that woman who was headed towards hell, or he would say to us today, we are headed towards Gehenna in some way through choice or pattern or rhythm or habit, he would say it's better that you come to a place now of surrendering your heart to me. Why? even though the people of Jerusalem knew that even the sun doesn't reach the depth of the valley of hell, Jesus says, behold, there is a light. And friends, there is a light that shines in every darkness, and his name is Jesus. And I believe what Jesus is saying is not some sort of arbitrary phrase like, I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. He's not saying it arbitrarily. He is picturing this, aware of the depth of that and saying there is a light that will overcome the depth of destruction in everyone's life. And when they walk in my light, their lives will be set free. John would later write in his later letter there in 1 John 5, he would write this, this is the message that we heard from Jesus. And we proclaim to you that God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie. We don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light... As Jesus is the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, the Son, cleanses us from all sin. Friends, here's what I want to put out before you right now. No matter your darkness, no matter your struggle, no matter your, your Matthew 5 moment, no matter your experience of John 7, 53 through John 8, 11, there is a John 8, 12 that follows every experience that precedes it. And friends, even if you're in the hell valley right now, Even if you're in the valley of the shadow of death right now, fear no evil. Why? Because light is coming. But in all of this testimony, in all of this revelation about the motif of light, the Pharisees say to him in verse 13, all you're doing is bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony isn't true. Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my my testimony is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going, but you do not know where I come from or where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh, whereas I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true. We'll see later in John's Gospel that Jesus has been given all authority to judge. For it is not I alone who judge, speaking of the empowerment, but I and the Father who sent me. All of this retort of the Pharisees is in response to Jesus saying the I am statement. I am the light of the world. And in fact, there are seven of those statements in John's Gospel. And every time we hear one of those seven statements, we go, yeah, go Jesus. Go Jesus, you are the light of the world. You are the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through you. That's awesome, and that's declarative of truth. But for the Pharisees, every time Jesus said, I am, it was like a hand grenade going off in their heads. Like, they hated it. In fact, they hated it so much, they're like, keep saying that all the way to the cross, because we're going to take you out. They really had an issue, and we're going to see that as unfolding in today's passage. Verse 17, in your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. What I believe Jesus is saying here is he is referring to his baptism, Matthew 3. We looked at it some weeks ago earlier in the series, where the heavens opened, a voice came forth, And the dove representing the Holy Spirit came and resided in that space. And I believe that Jesus is saying, see, there is a witness. There are two witnesses. I and the Father and the Spirit came and there is witness. But look what they say. They say in verse 19, yeah, yeah, yeah. About your Father, where is he? Where is your Father? 
Now, you've got to know at this time in history, Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus, is dead. But not only that, there are rumors circulating about the way Jesus was conceived. In the Middle East, it is the greatest insult that you can make about somebody is to question their, um, their parenthood or the fatherhood of their family. In fact, there is a B dash cuss word that is directly attributed to you are a son with no father. And in the Middle East, that is the greatest curse that you can say against someone. So they essentially say, yeah, 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 you are that kind of person. Where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke there in the treasury as he had taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. Verse 19. Look what it says. It says, you know neither me nor my father, for if you knew me, you would know my father also. He is saying we are one. Well, there is a personal application here. Meaning, you can't say yes to Jesus and deny the reality of what God says are his standards. In the same way, you can't say, I want to know God in terms of first century Judaism and deny Jesus and feel like you've got the deal because you haven't. But often in our culture, speaking more about our culture than their culture, I meet people all the time who have no issues with Jesus, but actually have great issue with what Jesus taught. And they love the thought of saying, I love Jesus. I love the thought, they love the thought of saying, Jesus is on my side. But can I tell you, Jesus is not some sort of entity that we can affiliate with while detaching ourselves from the effect of what he calls us to live according to. Let me say it to you again. You can't just say, oh, I'm for Jesus, and I do what I want, with whom I want, when I want, speak the way I want, but yet Jesus and I, we're, we're great. You're not great. Culture is not great. Even hearing in the media, even this past week, people misquoting scripture to say that God is on their side. I'm telling you, when we weaponize God against others, we find the weapons of God coming towards us. And I'm telling you, this is an issue here, and Jesus says, we're one. He says to them again, I'm going away, and you will seek me, verse 21, and you will die Jesus is beginning to turn the screw of intensity. You will die in your sin, for where I am going, you cannot <clears throat> come. So they're about to come at him and say, oh, he's just going to kill himself. He's going to do suicide and death by suicide, verse 22, which is deeply frowned upon in Jewish culture. But Jesus here is stunning them. He says, you're going to die in your sin. And he is saying this to devout religious people. Like, he reserved some of his harshest language towards people who thought they were self-righteous. Righteous through self-action. He says it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work based upon how you were born or the lineage that you subscribe to. It matters based upon the one that you pay worship to. The Jews said, will he kill himself? Since he says, where, where I'm going, you cannot come. Verse 23, Jesus said to them, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. In other words, we're not even talking about the same stuff here. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he who will die in your sins. So they said to him, who are you? Jesus said, just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge. But he who sent me is true. And I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They, they just didn't understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, we're going to come back to the Son of Man passage later this year when we go through a series in the Nicene Creed. The Son of Man is a passage from Daniel 7 and Daniel 9, which is both cryptic and prophetic and speaks about eschatology, the end of the world, so to speak. He says, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, meaning also the cross, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own authority but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. So Jesus is preaching. And as he was saying these things, many believed in him. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth. And here it is, every politician's favorite passage, and the truth will set you free. 
Friends, postmodernity says there is no truth to be found. I remember 25 or so years ago, I worked for a ministry here in town. And uh, I was compensated to fly around the country and to meet with international students as they studied here in the States to connect them with Christian believers, believers on the college campuses working for Christian ministries, to connect them recognizing that the upper echelon of the world comes here for an education and then returns to their country. All of this being said, the purpose was to equip them and to send them back with faith within their hearts. The challenge was that was during the time where post-modernity was saying there is no absolute truth. And I would go into session after workshop, gathering seminars after seminars where people would say, the denial of truth, the denial of absolute truth, you can't know the truth. And I'm telling you, 25 years ago, those thoughts were being espoused and before that. And now we are harvesting the reality of what it is that they were saying in the political realm, social realm, economic realm, in the family, everywhere that people are denying truth, thus they can create their own framework of what is right. Friends, play today out another 25 years. I tell you, we need a revival. We need the God of revival to come into our land. Amen. But in all of this, Jesus says, I am truth. There is truth to be found, and it's in the person of Christ. And he says, and abide in me and abide in my word. Well, the word at that time is not the canonized scripture because that has yet to be inspired as in the years that would follow. But in this context, he says, when you abide in me, relationship, and you abide in my work and word, that is that I am the Logos, John 1.1, 1, 1, Genesis 1, when you abide in me and we have community, there is truth that resides within you. Friends, I want to say this, though, about the Word of God. Our devotion to the Word of God determines the emotions that we see in our lives. Devotions determine emotions which in turn drive decisions which in turn ultimately outline the legacy of your life. So be careful to ensure what it is that you are devoted to. Devotions is the catchy Christian word to say, I'm doing my devotion. But devotion is essentially you surrendering yourself to Jesus and saying, Jesus, come and be the Lord of my life. I vacate the throne of my life and I invite you to reside upon the throne of my life. What does that mean? It means practically you're not in charge. It means practically you don't get to do what it is that you want to do. People often say, well, how do I know what it is that the Spirit wants me to do? It's typically the opposite of what you would prefer to do. You go, I don't know what to do with that colleague. I want to punch him in the face. The Spirit of God would probably tell you the opposite, I would imagine. And so you go, okay, well, how do I grow in this? Through the Word of God and immersing yourself in the Word of God. Devotions determine emotions which drive decisions which ultimately outline the legacy of your life. Oftentimes I'll ask myself, Daniel, are your current devotions suitable for what it is that you're hoping to become in this world. Meaning, does your current devotional habit shape and inform the kind of person that you hope to become? If you haven't read the word in months, you're probably like, I'm good, I got this. You not got this. I'll tell you, the more you read the word, the more the word reads you, and the more you read it, the more you want to read it. I'll tell you, read a verse or two in the morning, and all of a sudden you'll start to find you have a lot of wisdom throughout the day. Why? Because you'll start to say to people in conversational situations what it is that you read earlier. And you thought it was just for you. It's not just for you. The word doesn't return void any time it's given. And all of a sudden you start to share this. But he says, immerse yourself in the reality of the word. Verse 33, they answered him, we are the offspring of Abraham. In other words, God owes us because of our birth and our behavior. And then they go on to say, and we have never been enslaved to anyone. So how is it that you say you will become free? There is rich irony in these words, by the way. They say, we have never been enslaved to anyone. Well, do you remember what I said at the beginning of the message as to the reason of the candelabra? The candelabra was lit for them to remember that they were once enslaved to the nation of Egypt, but God led them to their exodus, and now they're a free nation. They've never been enslaved to anyone. But yet also Jesus could have said, did you read the paper this morning? Like I was in the paper this morning and it's all this Roman language and Roman soldiers and I just feel like, are they in charge around here? Tongue in cheek irony. The point is Jesus says, you're enslaved now. But it reveals a deeply personal principle here and that is this, that we, can, we become blind to our own blindness. And friends, we might say, I'm not enslaved to anything or anyone. I can stop doing that whenever I want. 
I could stop drinking that anytime I want it. I'm not fixated on that problem. I could cut it off. I don't have anxiety. I could stop worrying. Just watch me. Like, we get enslaved, and the reality is we, like them, say, Jesus, I got this. I'm not enslaved to anything. And he goes on to say this. Truly I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Friends, that is the way sin works. Everyone who is in currently a crisis and a battle through an addiction, it all began with saying, I just simply want some relief. I had a long day at work. I just want to, I just want to drink a beer. And all of a sudden, that which you reached out to grab has now grabbed you and you can't let go of it. Or whatever it might be. Scrolling through stuff online, being addicted to social, whatever it might be, you go, it's just a little relief. And now all of a sudden, you're spending hours every week. Can I even say every day? On social. I just want to know what people are doing. You are fixated on something and you go, I'm not enslaved. And you're always scrolling through stuff. He says, if you're practicing sin, you're a slave to sin. This whole passage is about freedom. And you know, sometimes we can believe, and culture would tell us this, that freedom is about throwing off social restraint. Do what you want, with whom you want, whenever you want. Friends, I want to tell you, that is not freedom. That is affliction. Freedom is surrendering your heart to Jesus. Joy is found when you surrender your heart to Jesus and you live in the fullness of what he has done for you and you reach out and love those that are otherwise hard to love. That is joy. That is freedom. People are like, no, 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 it's so fun to get hammered in the middle of the week and to throw up on the weekend. I love that. Really, do you? Like speaking to young people, I used to be in youth ministry and I used to be in young adult ministry and I, those who are coming to faith, they're like, man, it was so awesome. Went clubbing over the weekend, got hammered, got with him or got with her and it was amazing and I'm like, awesome. And they're like, yeah, no, it wasn't awesome. The reality is there is joy to be found in Jesus and there is affliction and slavery found when we do what it is that we want. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are the offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, and now it's about to get real, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. In other words, if you were really friends of Abraham, we would be friends because God's plan has always been through Abraham and onwards to gather a people unto himself. But he goes, the reality is we're not. Romans 9, Paul will later write and say, not everyone who professes to be a child of Abraham is the child of Abraham. Another message for another day. But in this situation, verse 40, he says, otherwise you're not doing the works of Abraham and in fact you're trying to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. And they then said to him, "Uh uh-huh, really? Well, we weren't born of sexual immorality. That might seem a little out of context, but what that is, is them having a dig at Jesus' mom. And I'm telling you, you ladies would support this. I tell you, mess with someone's mom, all of a sudden, the joke's gone to a whole new level. Well, that's what they're doing here. They're essentially saying, your mom messed up big time. And that's how you're even here. Your dad's gone, he died, he's already gone, and you're here now, and this is the reality, at least we weren't born of sexual immorality because we have one father, even God. Jesus then said to them, okay, let's play this out for a moment. If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? Is it because you cannot bear to hear my word? And then here is where Jesus inverts the earlier family accusation and insult on them. Verse 44, you are of your father. They're like, "Uh uh-huh. He says, yep, it's the devil. In other words, you might think my mom messed up. Your mom, dang gone, really messed up. Like she really got with the wrong bloke. Your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. Okay, so it's getting real now. And does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies... That's who he is. That's his character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, here it is. Why is it you don't believe me? You can't believe me. Which one of you convicts me then of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? And then here it is, verse 47, which is very triggering for today's culture because it's uh, either you're on team Jesus or team devil. There is no. 
There are not a lot of options. Whoever is of God, Team Jesus, hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are on Team Devil. You are not of God. The Jews answered him, okay, we're real mad now. Are we not right in saying that you're a Samaritan and have a demon? <clears throat> okay, in other words, at this point, we don't even think you're Jewish. Not only do we think you came about through sexual immorality, you're a half-bred Jew. And add to that, we think you're demon-possessed. Lovely, Jesus said. I do not have a demon, rather, because <clears throat> I want to honor my father, and yet you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, we're almost done. If anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, now we know you have a demon, because Abraham died, as did the prophets. Yet you say, quote, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death, end quote. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? Well, John doesn't record the moment that Jesus could have gone then, yes, yes, I am better than Abraham, but that's a fight we'll reserve for another day. But he answers, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. By the way, underline verse 54, because that is as true with Jesus as it is with us today. You try to glorify yourself, there is no glory within you. Live for the glory of God, who is unwilling to share his glory with any other, and there is this light that shines through you. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you, but I do know him, <clears throat> and I keep his word. Friends, we're about to wrap this moment up, but verse 55 is where we're going to come back to here in just a moment. Speaking about knowing God. <clears throat> Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day, he saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you are not yet even 50 years old and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. I am is the name of God. Before Abraham was, I am. I was there. Speaking of even the Hebrew name of God. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus pulled a Jason Bourne, hid himself, and went out of the temple. I love that scene in Jason Bourne where he's in Marseille and he hides behind that little scooter thing. I had to watch Jason Bourne 10 times before I could actually see he runs behind the thing. I thought he was raptured and I don't even believe in that. But anyway, that's a story for another time. Anyway, with this all being said, let's apply this moment. The line says, you don't know him, but I know him. Friends, I wanna say this to you right now. It is not going to church that saves you. It is not serving with the kids' ministry that saves you. It might sanctify you, but it doesn't save you. It is not working in middle school. As much as that too might lend to your breakthrough and sanctification, the reality is, though, this, that we are saved not through attendance, but, re but repentance. And saying yes to Jesus. There is that time in Matthew 7 where he says, these people do all these things, but at the end of the day, he says, get away from me, I don't even know you. Friends, repentance is attractive to the heart of God. Arrogance is repulsive to the character of God. Arrogance is saying, I can do it. Repentance says, I can't do it. And I wanna say that this hope that we place in Jesus is not a, a hope that's foolish. For the resurrection tells us that everything that Jesus said about his life is true. That three days after facing the reality of death to pay the penalty for our sin, he, the innocent, paid the price for the guilty, that we, the guilty, go free. By grace, now through faith, we can know God. And that is the great message of the kingdom of God. The gospel is, we sin, we fell, he wins, he rose victorious, and when we surrender our sin to him and we ask him to come into our life by the grace of the woman caught in adultery and by the truth of the statement that he is the light of the world, we are saved. C.S. Lewis said it this way, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. Let's pray together. Father, we pray right now that your light would come. We pray right now that your light would shine within our lives. 
we even give you right now the permission to, to take the metaphorical flashlight of truth and to shine it around the dark parts of our lives. Spirit of God, we give you permission. Jesus, we invite you to take absolute ownership and control over our lives, to shine truth into those dark places, to reveal hope in those hopeless places, to overcome the valley of Gehenna, the valley of hell that many of us find ourselves in. Come even now and shine light into the places where darkness occupies hope. And in this moment, we want to say yes to you. If you're here right now and you've yet to ever say yes to Jesus, I want to encourage you right now just to, for the very first time perhaps in your life, just maybe just turn your hand upwards before heaven. And I just want to pray a prayer that you might say inside of yourself, Lord Jesus, we need you. Come into my life in this moment. I repent of my sin. I invite you to be the overcomer of my life. I want to live for you for the remainder of my life. To the glory of God, I pray. We are so glad that you joined us this weekend. Join us next week as we continue on in our series in the book of John. It's been such a great series, and we can't wait to kick it off again next week. Love you guys. See you next week.